for myself, it's just me personally, AEW Double or Nothing is the perfect type of pay-per-view for me doing this stuff here on YouTube, for me talking about wrestling on social media. There's a combination of really good things, really nice things that happen on the show, really dumb, really stupid, really shitty things that happen on the show, and then obviously I get an opportunity to include an obligatory, necessary, required Cody Rhodes rant. It crosses the whole gamut here. And you might say, well, you would think you would want to watch a great show or a damn near perfect show more than anything else. No, if anything, I'd rather watch a totally shitty show or, best of all, a show that gives me something for everything. You get some good, you get some bad, and you get some roads. How about that? So, first thing that really stood out to me about AEW Double or Nothing, though, was the, was the crowd being there. Having a full house, like, you would been so long without it, like, you almost became used to the fans not being there and feeling like wrestling was being done in a morgue. And instead, you get a reminder of just how cool and awesome having live fans there is and how much they can actually add to the event and how much they can really help the big league feel of it. And that certainly happened Sunday night at Daly's Plaza. Those fans added a lot to the show, especially the first few matches, especially. I mean, that was good stuff. And it's just kind of heartening to see that maybe we're starting to climb back to a little more of normalcy in the world. And we all certainly could use that. So that in and of itself was the ultimate highlight of the night. Uh, but when you look at this show, it started off the main card with Brian Cage versus Hangman Page. And this was a really nice opener. The crowd was clearly behind Page, and I mean Hangman Page, and as a result, they were totally against the machine Brian Cage, and it's perfect. Like, the dynamics here really work. The crowd is universally behind this one guy, universally against the other guy as a consequence, and the dynamics of the match just work better. And what I love about it is, just as they were starting to do too much and they were starting to get carried away, because this was a match that they could have went a more simplistic route and focus on the emotional investment, focus on the storytelling. They mix some shit in, which I have to live with with modern wrestling. That's fine. But just when it got to be too much, it was over. Like, you look at what the finisher could have been and what the finish of the match actually was. It's like, eh. But at least you advance some type of story between Team Taz and Brian Cage. So it was a really, really, really good way to kick off the show. The next match, not so much. The AEW Tag Team Championship. Like, this is the same old typical bucks of suck bullshit. It's exactly what the fuck it is. If you have no standards or you're easily popped by a bunch of dumbass moves that mean nothing, no logic, no storytelling whatsoever, then obviously you fucking love this match because you have no standards. I don't have no problem saying that. Like, Jesus Christ, it's not just about the moves in the fucking matches themselves. They got to piece together well. The match has got to flow. It's got to make fucking sense. And of course it fucking doesn't. Um, you know, Moxley and Kingsley, I think, Kingston, I think, did their best here. Uh, but, you know, you get one sequence where Moxley connects on two pile drivers and we're acting like absolutely nothing fucking happened. And then you got a Meltzer driver out on the fucking ramp. And again, nothing happens. Nobody sells shit. It's all stupid. There's no consequence. There's no reason to really get emotionally invested, except for the idiots that were there in Jacksonville because they get cheap popped by every fucking move because they're idiots. Have some fucking standards here. I can't imagine people looking at this match and thinking that this is good, thinking that this is what professional wrestling should be. It's not. It absolutely should not be. And all of that said, I could rant and rave about this for a lot longer but I want to save that time for Cody Rhodes, which is far more deserving than this bullshit. This is just more typical bucks of suck bullshit. All of this and they retain LOL what the fuck ever. The Casino Battle Royal. Um, here's what I find really confusing. Is Brian Pillman Jr.'s in this. You're talking about his dad's Dark Side of the Ring episode. And you're mentioning that. Why not give him a big push here? Why not at least have him last to the final four, the final three, maybe even the final two? Like it's not going to cause you any significant damage to do that. Why in the fuck wouldn't you? 
Like, even for those really marky fans that are going to excuse pretty much everything AEW and Master Khan does, like, they even got to look at this and say, that was a missed opportunity. That was really fucking stupid. Because it was. Sometimes you get one opportunity to do something big like this. Well, then, by God, you better make the most of it. That was weird. I laughed when I saw Leo Rush was the Joker, and it was cool. Like, okay, cool. He's got a job again. I'm happy for him. I'm trying to figure out like where he would stand out here or where he would be so different from anybody else. But, you know, I guess he was a little bit of a surprise. Uh, a couple of people pointed out on Twitter, and I want to call this out because they're right. Apparently, Christian doesn't outwork everyone. <laughs> Pretty ca crappy tagline if you don't actually live up to it. Uh, to me, maybe Jungle Boy winning wasn't much of a surprise, even though you had thought maybe at this point maybe Christian would have. But why him? Why is this company so behind him? Now, some of you are going to point out, well, this means you're going to see more Luchasaurus, which, you know, in theory, is always going to be a good thing for me. I wish they would take Komarodo and put him with the Jurassic Express because he's a fucking caveman. Like, how do you miss this? It's like he, the dude is cut from central fucking casting. You want to make stars? That's how you make stars. Put a fucking caveman with a dinosaur and a boy, and a bitch, and you can make some stars out of everybody but the bitch. I'm just trying to figure out why people are so hyped up on Jungle Boy. Like, what does he do other than be Luke Perry's son that is so fantastic or so different or so unique from anybody else? Like, it doesn't make me rage that he gets a title shot because I didn't Jelly Janela get a title shot at some point. I mean, other scrubs gotten title shots. You know, at least I could say Jungle Boy is somewhat over and part of an interesting gimmick, but just weird to me, that's all. Um, but then we get to the big piece of shit of the night, and this was the ultimate of piece of shit. Like, me bitching about the bucks of suck, like, that's a place where some will agree with me, some of you will disagree with me, because some of us, like me, have taste, and some of you do not. But anybody that praises this Anthony Agogo cody Rhodes match should have their fucking head examined. God, this was awful on so many different fucking levels. Of course, I know you're in Jacksonville, military fucking haven, so you're going to sit there and run this stupid-ass Memorial Day video package trying to get everybody popped up on the nationalistic propaganda of America. But the whole dynamic of this whole story is fucking stupid. Anthony Agogo is the one that's actually had to overcome obstacles Cody Rhodes is a nepotistic rip-off son of a bitch. Anthony Agogo is the world-class athlete, former bronze medal Olympic boxer, who also happens to be biracial and, by the way, which makes it not easy for him in and of itself, on top of that, also like 78% blind in one eye, but Cody Rhodes, since he's blonde-haired and blue-eyed and the son of the American Bween, baby, we gotta push him like a fucking baby face. Like, the dynamics of this are so stupid. And anybody that cheers for Cody Rhodes is fucking stupid. Not because Cody Rhodes is a lying piece of crap. Because the whole dynamics of this are fucking stupid. But at least I was thinking, you know what, hey. Even with all of that. They gotta be sensible enough in AEW to understand that you should be trying to build a beast here. You should be able to try to build an athletic freak here. That does not require go Cody Rhodes going over in any way, shape, or form. You should be making a go-go look great. Instead, you make a go-go look weak and fucking vulnerable to the point where fucking Cody Rhodes gets hit with both a gut punch and an uppercut. It doesn't take him out. Cody doesn't even have to hit his finisher on a go-go to beat him. This is fucking stupid. And anybody that defends this garbage is themselves garbage. How appropriate. Cody has no problem with a black woman laying on her back for him. But when it comes time for him to return the favor and do what's good and right for business and lay on his back for the black man to put the black man over for the fucking three count, he couldn't fucking do it. This was founder bullshit through and fucking through. I would take a hundred bucks a suck matches back to back over having to watch this fucking egomaniac, fucking narcissistic ass. Did you focus group to finish on this one, you cocksucking son of a bitch? 
And why? What the fuck? Who gives a shit about this fucking America shit to begin with that they do the clown? Furthermore, there is absolutely nothing from a babyface standpoint that is appealing with Cody Rhodes. He is the egomaniac. He is the obstacle. He is the fucking heel here. Get some goddamn self-awareness. And then they sit there and take this legitimate world-class athlete and have to make sure he does the fucking job for you. So you beat QT Marshall, you beat one of the students, and then you beat, like, the prize fucking pupil. The fuck was the point of any of this? I, we know what it was. Some Georgia mid-card piece of crap. That's what the hell it was. It's Jacksonville jack off and fuck off. Anybody that likes him can fuck off. Fuck this match. Fuck that propping fucking Cody bitch. TNT Championship. Archer almost killed himself, but largely, like, this match wasn't that notable. And maybe, admittedly, it was because I was so irritated and pissed off about Cody playing his mid-card founder games. Um, but do any of you really remember much about Archer and Miro other than the snake getting thrown and Archer um, almost killing himself with a dive? I don't know. Uh, the AEW Women's Championship. God, I wanted this to be a squash. Because this shit went way too fucking long. Way too long. Way too much bullshit. Way too many false finishes. I get the one thing if Sheeta was like this great champion, but she wasn't. She is the worst long reigning. When I say long reigning, I'm talking about like one plus year. So 365 days or more. She is the worst year plus reigning champion I have ever seen in any fucking company. And some of you a-holes are going to bring up A name, B or C, but at least I will say... For a lot of those, all those cases, they probably were consistently featured on television every week and consistently had feuds. And this bitch didn't have any of it. She was in the crowd fucking 80 or 90 percent of the time. The matches she did have were randomly thrown to fucking gather. There was absolutely no reason that Britt Baker had to go through all this bullshit just to beat this garbage ass champion. And even at one point, when... Rebel hits fucking Brit with the crutch. The ref's just standing there watching it. Technically, isn't that a goddamn DQ? The hell's going on here? The only good thing about it is Brit won. We got a legitimate women's champion in AEW for the first time in over a year. Thank you, Sheeta. Fuck you, Sheeta. Bye, Sheeta. You suck. Never again. People talking, I saw some people on Twitter talking about, this is heartbreaking, she was a great champion. What the fuck did she do? What the hell is wrong with you? Unbelievable. It was unbelievable, though. Sting took off the shirt Sunday night. Holy shit. He was serious. He came to play. Sting and Darby Allen versus Ethan Page and Scorpio Sky was really good. Now, I thought that Scorpio Sky had turned heel and broken off to do his own single thing just to immediately be back in the tag team, but whatever. Um, but this was by far the better tag team match of the night. There's actually some type of story here. The fans were actually emotionally connected. Whereas you got the Young Bucks just flipping, flopping the fucking around. At least you say the fans are really invested in Darby Allen and what he does. The fans are obviously and were obviously incredibly invested in Sting and what he does. You could do 300 flaming ash shards of glass gradunzels into the fucking uh, plastic ramp of doom. But you get Sting to do one little splash off of the ramp and some well-timed no-sells. Like, it was fucking perfect. Like, the timing of this match was really good. Everything about it worked. Darby Allen did a great job of getting heat so Sting could make the big comeback, the big save. Some of you might bitch about the fact, well, why is Sting pinning anybody in the fucking company at 61 eight years of age? Because the reality is it's fucking Sting. It's not WWE where you sit there and bring in a legend and an icon and have him lose in his matches. You got to put him over a little bit. You got to validate the legend a little bit before you potentially start having him lose to full. And eventually, if you're going to have him and Darby Allen wrestle, and you're going to have Darby Allen go over, you want Sting putting Darby Allen over to mean something. It means something when it happens. They've handled Sting well here. Sting delivered. Darby Allen delivered. Ethan Page was good here. Scorpio Sky was good here. I can't imagine looking at the two tag matches on this show and getting so sucked in by all the moves and bullshit that made no logical fucking sense. 
Like, at one point in time, both of the Young Bucks are just sitting there going after Moxley for an extended period of time because we do tornado tag bullshit with these ass clowns. The ref's just standing there watching. And meanwhile, Kingston's out on a fucking apron just looking at him. Get in there, asshole! What the hell are you doing? This tag match, however, you had emotional connection. You had emotional investment. You had these guys actually try to tell some type of story. Some of the big spots actually meant something. I could even tie it in like Darby Allen's a fucking psycho. Sing Sting still got it and bursts in pockets. Like, this was fantastic to me. It really helped perk me up until I realized that we still had the world title triple threat. And I'm not going to rag on it too much. It was about what the hell I would have expected for a match that featured Kenny Omega and Pac and Orange Cassidy. You know, I think they did the best they could to at least get people to that place where they thought or believed potentially that either Pac or Orange Cassidy would win. But you knew at the end of the day, Kenny Omega was going to. But like I said, I'm not going to really shit on this one this much because this was more of a placeholder world title match than a match you really take seriously. And that reality dawned on me as well as the match was starting because I said, oh shit, it's after 11 o'clock Eastern. And don't we still have that stadium stampede match? We did. We absolutely fucking did. Please note, AEW, if you're going to run your pay-per-views four hours, could you please not run them at 8 p.m. Eastern? Could you start them a little earlier? I'm just saying, especially if you're doing it on a Sunday night, because yes, Monday might be the Memorial Day holiday, but you got other folks that got to fucking work the next day. But Kenny Omega retains... It's about what you would have expected. Yeah, it's cool for me. Like, yeah, they did too much shit. Way too many false finishes. Like I said, typical cleaner match bullshit. I did pop at one point when somebody chanted, said, Olivier! <laughs> did Cornette get his way into Daly's Plaza? Oh. But we finally get to the main event, the stadium stampede. And it was this weird, it felt like combination of taped and live. Um... Yeah, this was really long, and I think I probably would have enjoyed this a little more if it wasn't coming up on midnight. Like, I was kind of over the show at this point, and then you got this other match, and it's really long, and the way you did it, like, you're going throughout the stadium. Like, I totally understand the spot you did with Urban Meyer and Charlie Strong because you knew that that was going to get featured on NFL social media. Like, with MJF and Jericho, like, that makes sense. You should be doing that shit. And thank God Jericho had a damn shirt on, so he's not going to get clowned too much. Um, like, that strategically makes sense. I understand all of that. And there were some good spots and some good shit in here. It just it lasted a really, really long time. It's cool that Sammy Guevara got the win over fucking Sean Spears, although you just look at Sean Spears and you say, what the hell are you there to do? Conan being the fucking DJ... And, and the disco that apparently didn't have anybody fucking in it. <laughs> Conan can't draw shit to flies in a, as a DJ. <laughs> um, like I said, I got annoyed with this more as it continued to go along because to me, it was just going on too long. Like, t -t -t today, Junior, let's get to the goddamn point here. Um, I'm sure if I went back and watched it again, it would be okay. But I just wonder... With this being your first show with fans there, like this stadium stampede match absolutely should have been on Dynamite. And the blood and guts match should have been the main event of this show. Imagine doing the blood and guts match in front of a, a Daly's Plaza full of people or Daly's Place, whatever the fuck. Imagine that. Arena full of people at Daly's for that blood and guts match. That's what you should have been doing. That should have been the closeout to the show. And now it's weird, like, you did the blood and guts thing, you done the stadium stampede thing, like, are we really going to have a third big blow-off match on Dynamite in a month or a month and a half between these two groups? You know, inner circle wins, inner circle remains, but, you know, what do you do from here? Because it's 1-1, it feels like it's odd to stop it there, and you certainly don't seem inclined to do that, but what are you going to do next? I'm just wondering. So... If you're not just some sheepish bot that geeks out for everything AEW does, what was really worth your time on this show? Cage and Page was very good. Um, Sting and Darby versus Ethan Page and Scorpio Sky was really good. Um, if you fast forward through some of the other bullshit, like the stadium stampede probably is better when it's not at the end of a four-hour show. 
Um, it was great to see the fans there, though. Like, if anything else, that's the biggest highlight of the night for me is the fact that we've got a, an arena, a stadium full of fans, again, for professional wrestling, and it does definitely make a difference.